All right, Sagar, what's on your radar? Well, the Senate compromise bill between Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer has many, many problems, and Chris and I are going to be laying out a lot of them today. But it did at least have a ray of hope. The measly $1,200 payment to those who made less than $75,000 last year and $500 per child to at least get some people through some hard times and a beefed up unemployment insurance, which would essentially cover people at 100 percent for a period of three to four months. And as someone who's fought against fiscal austerity and other foolishness within the GOP, I wouldn't call this a victory, but it was a battle to even get it to there. Well, that wasn't until, of course, Lindsey Graham rode in on his high horse at the end with Senators Ben Sass and Tim Scott threatening to blow up the entire bill yesterday. Let's take a listen to his reasoning. You're a nurse, aide, making 15 or $16 an hour. You're on the front lines here. A lot of doctor's offices are going to have to roll back because elective surgery is no longer a source of income for a bunch of doctors. So you're going to have all these well-trained nurses they're going to make $24 an hour on unemployment. You're literally incentivizing taking people out of the workforce at a time when we need critical infrastructure supplied with workers. So let's think about that for a second. Lindsey Graham's objection is that unemployment insurance is too good and might incentivize people who work in essential industries like nursing to simply stay at home and work. So, OK, I accept some validity to that argument. Though what Graham didn't mention is that you can't get unemployment if you quit your job. You have to be laid off. But let's go even further. If your concern is that people will make more relative to unemployment, then they will be working. The solution is simple. It's called increasing direct cash payments to everybody, unconditional of their wage. It's called making the payment monthly until the end of the crisis. And here's the best part. Who was the chief opponent of direct cash payments in the first place? Who advocated for beefing up the unemployment insurance program? Ladies and gentlemen, in his own words, Lindsey Graham. I think that the package passed by the House had wide bipartisan support. I don't like the family leave set up. <clears throat> I think is we should have gone through the unemployment insurance route. We should have said to any company out there, any worker, that if you can't work because of the coronavirus, you're going to get your you're going to keep getting your check. My focus is not giving people a check from the government. My focus is to make sure you get your pay, paycheck from your employer. I'm willing to float loans to employers to make sure the payroll continues. Here we go again. Even after they pack the bill full of corporate wish lists, some people in the GOP just can't let go of their ideology. Because if their concern was just the unemployment incentive, then they would advocate for more direct cash payments. And again, I find it important to say this again and again and again. $1,200 is barely enough to stave off disaster for most Americans, especially when rent is coming due next month. Guess what? Those direct cash payments? Well, according to the New York Times, about 70 million will get their check, quote, within a few weeks. But for eligible Americans who don't have direct deposit information on file with the IRS, they might have to wait four months. Need I tell you who are the people least likely to have direct deposit information on file with the IRS? It's the working poor of America. Those who transact with cash and money orders and are generally invisible to our financial system. I am probably more disgusted with Congress than I've ever been. And even though this monologue is about GOP actors, Democratic leadership is in no way less complicit. Don't forget, Nancy Pelosi tried to get diversity and inclusion funding in her proposal, along with a bunch of other stupid woke tokenist proposals. At every single turn, Congress has held rightful payments to American citizens hostage to the petty wants and needs of corporatists in both parties. And for that, we should all be rightfully indignant. Because right before the shenanigans began in the Senate, they indicated, of course, that the moment after they voted for this bill, they would recess until the end of April. Three weeks from now, do your worries for you and your family simply stop over the next three weeks? What if the crisis gets worse? What if more relief is needed? What if industries collapse? What if, what if, what if again and again throughout this crisis, they seem intent upon proving me right? They were never going to rise to the occasion. It was going to be a corporate 2008 type bailout all over again. We've given the greatest bridge loan in history to the richest people in America. And Americans barely get a bridge loan to two weeks from now. And remember this, neoliberals in Washington have effectively stripped average Americans of power in all sectors over the years, economically, culturally, civically, the media, more. And the only thing that people have left is the power. And we should all remember it whenever the time comes. 
Well said. Well, I mean, I'm looking at this and I just feel rage because it's like right at the end, you know, you have Lindsey Graham and them talking about how unemployment might disincentivize people to work when he's the first person who said he wants to beef up the unemployment insurance program in lieu of increasing direct cash payments for all. And that's the obvious counter, right? You're like, okay, well, if you don't want to incentivize or whatever. Right. And I accept some, I mostly think it's BS, but I, you know, I accept some of validity to that argument. Increase the direct cash payment instead. Yeah. Don't make a wage compete with unemployment. I just, just give everybody money. I just cannot imagine the mindset that would have you yeah. look at this yeah. trash heap dumpster fire of a yeah. bill that gives away $4 trillion to big business who probably doesn't even need it. I keep bringing this up right. because I think it's so important. Boeing CEO says he doesn't even want the money if it comes with the wrong strings <laughs> attached. And your issue is that a working class person may right. make a little bit more than they ordinarily would. And by the way, these are, these are the same people who talk all the time about the dignity of work, that work is more than just a paycheck. And you know what? It is. They're right about that. that. Have you ever met any nurses? Do you think they're <laughs> in it for the money? Are you kidding me? Like you would, t you would pick up so many different professions before you would take on the incredibly, incredibly challenging, emotionally, physically taxing work of being a nurse for the money. Yeah, nursing it's insanity. is probably the most thankless profession. Of course, of course and it again, is. You know what? You want to talk about perversive incentive, perverse incentives? How about? a bridge loan of $4 trillion to corporate America to be able to get through this crisis and be more powerful than ever whenever they come out of it while working Americans probably get a measly $1,200 check. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't even know if another check is coming. I frankly doubt it. In three weeks, I mean, we'll see. I yeah, actually- You know I, what, Sagar? Yeah. Now that the market's doing better, they don't care. That's what I mean. They so don't care. Look, I mean, $1,200, I think the only way it'll happen, and this is my great fear, which we'll talk with Aaron Glantz later in the show, is that- People aren't going to pay their rent on April 1st, and you are going to have cascading effects through the financial system. You've already seen the Cheesecake Factory, for example, the, one of the largest, biggest uh, sit-down restaurants in America. It says it's not going to be able to pay its rent on yeah. April 1st. I mean, that's everybody. Think individuals are going to be able I to manage to some it people, if they can. I talked to some people in corporate real estate who are talking about 95% of businesses of their clients not being able to pay. That amount of money crawls up through the financial system. And again, they don't care, but they do care. To make sure that corporate America has its bridge the only and the snapback way, provisions. The only way people are going to get more money than what was in this bill is if the market crashes again right. and they think that cash payments would do something to remedy this. Yeah. Bernie Sanders, though, I got to give him a lot of credit because he was the person who went hard when Lindsey Graham and Ben Sass and they all came out and did their thing and said, we're going to shut this down if we if these working class people could get an extra few dollars out of this. He said, look. I'm not going to stand for that. If you're going to try to change this bill, I'm going to put my own hold on the bill. And he gave an impassioned floor speech on the Senate floor last night that was really something to watch. Let's take a listen. And now I find that some of my Republican colleagues are very distressed. They're very upset that somebody who's making 10, 12 bucks an hour might end up with a paycheck for four months more than they received last week. Oh my God, the universe is collapsing. Imagine that. Somebody who's making 12 bucks an hour, now like the rest of us, faces an unprecedented economic crisis with the 600 bucks on top of their normal, their regular unemployment check, might be making a few bucks more for four months. Oh my word, will the universe survive? It was this a funny moment. Bill, for and this bill was already bad enough as it is. I wish, I mean, I wish that there had been more energy in the Senate around shutting it down entirely. And I'm going to talk about this in my radar. And as we've been discussing, just pass the worker and small business part and then figure out yeah. if you need and corporate triple bailouts. The small business part. Again, it's only 350 uh, Triple the small business. It's not enough. Increase the payments, yeah. make them monthly. Like, th I wish there had been more energy and more of a push and more aggressive tactics to get to there. But at least Bernie shut down 
the uh, push to make the bill even worse he and did. even more piddling than it already what? is. And we'll talk about this too. This is what disappoints me. Nobody, they all voted they for all, it. Everyone 96 voted for it. Warren, Bernie, Josh Hawley, Marco Rubio, all these other people. And I can tell you, I've been telling this, but I was involved, you know, talking with a lot of people while this thing was getting put together. The amount of political capital that was spent just trying to get the payments yeah. to 1,200 and non-means tested, you wouldn't believe. And, but it and is means tested, the amount, not regressive. Well, uh, not regressive, not yeah. regressive. The amount of political capital just trying to get those small business loans in there. And look how easy it was to get the $4 trillion bridge loan. That tells you everything. Who has power in Washington? And these populists, I don't blame Bernie and Warren and Holly and Rubio and all those people for having to vote for it because leadership put guns to all of their heads. Yep. And they said, if you guys hold this up, then payments aren't going out to You're going to be the villain. You can't live with that on your heart to yeah. not have uh, to not have people at least get a check. Yeah. And that's what they did to all of us is that they made they they tied it together and they basically killed any ability of real oversight and scrutiny and i mean it's it's a very depressing moment because and even though i said and, and on the left like, we said this was going to happen yeah like two weeks ago it's still depressing it's like you see it and you're like i had a little bit of hope but now it's just gone and on the left that the most that they could get is some like oversight. token oversight modeled on 2008 as if that's the bar that we want to set as if that's the model like okay you can still have your massive you know historically unprecedented slush fund to do with as you please but at least we're going to watch you while you do it great congratulations that's amazing yeah, that's way to just... way to get a win there guys but you know Sagar, and this is something i'm sure we're going to continue to talk about this is where if you did have some trust between the left and the right populace and had some active communication and active working together they could be a real force yeah. to shape the dynamics here because leadership on both sides would have to listen to them and to have that bipartisan united populist front on issues like this could have made a real difference. They could but have stood up and they're not there yet. They weren't able to do it. 96 that you know, what do we always say here? Fear the things that are bipartisan in Washington. Yep, there That's is I fear. Gridlock is a myth. There is a bipartisan consensus. Yeah. We saw it in the Senate last night. There you go. All right, I'm looking forward to your radar next, Crystal.